established for each particular frame. A completed PT takes 62 of them, each slightly differing from all others. With the frames assembled, all present and accounted for, the birth of another PT can be started. They are so light, despite their great lateral strength, that they can be handled by a couple of men. It's not unheard of for a woman to help carry a frame from screeve board to the jig. On the floor lies the wooden jig, establishing the proper place for each frame. Frame after frame is set in place. As the vessel begins to shape up, a surprising fact is obvious. Defying common laws of boat construction, it rests bottom side up. This Elko innovation permits easier assembly in the early stages and work on the hull from above rather than from a cramped position below. At intervals among the frames, seven watertight bulkheads are to be inserted. They divide the boat into sections with small watertight doors for passage. When the main bulkhead is put into the jig, it's set at a certain angle of declivity. All the other bulkheads and frames are then brought into an exactly parallel position. Once the angle of declivity has been established throughout, the first nails and screws are put in to keep them steady until other reinforcing parts have been added. The stern, or transom bulkhead, comes on last. The steam box is used to prepare wood for bending. Where the bottom meets the side, long, heavy pieces of white oak run the length of the boat. These are called chines. While still hot, moist and limber, they are put into a mold corresponding to the shape of the boat at any given point. Later, cooled out and dry, they retain the shape the mold has given them, but are still somewhat pliable. Here, as elsewhere in a wooden PT, there is a tough resilience not found in more rigid steel-hulled vessels. The backbone of any ship is the keel. In a PT, it's a massive molded 80 feet of bolted Sitka spruce. Two expert Scandinavian artists with the ads hew all the keels to a pencil line accuracy. 30 years on the job have given them the confidence and incredible skill necessary for this kind of work. One bad stroke could ruin the labor of days, but they never miss. Finished, the surface is as smooth as plain and sandpaper could achieve. At the bow, the keel is sharp as a knife edge. It's a long, unwieldy member like a spine without ribs. The PT still rests ignobly on its back, like a helpless beetle. Men climb and pound the keel into place. Next, the white oak chines and gunnels are set in place, marking the division of bottom and side, and side and deck. They are the boat's wide, flaring shoulders. Diagonal battens are fastened along the sides, a first binding of cartilage over the bare ribs. Inner planking crosses the battens on the other diagonal. The boat takes form as you watch. A heavy coating of glue is spread all over this planking. Then they stretch and tack on it yards and yards of the finest airplane cloth. Glue and cloth are bound together by ironing. Hand irons for sections within easy reach. Long handled irons when an arm is too short. The heat causes the glue to seep into cracks and impregnate the cloth. Already it would be impossible to spring a leak, but there is more to come. Another planking goes on the outside. This time, the entire hull is nailed and riveted to eternity. You wonder how there's room for so many nails, rivets, and screws. They are brass, copper, monel, stainless steel, each best for its purpose. One PT boat repairs over 400,000 of them. At noon, the Elko canteens provide a kind of food that heartens workers in essential war industry. A cafeteria ministers to the desires of sit-down eaters. Mr. Sutphin, the executive vice president, can be found there too with some of his fellow executives and visiting naval officers. An additional activity of the noon hour is apt to be a bond rally or morale building entertainment. But more vital to the factory's main job is another noon custom. The hull is now ready to be turned right side up. A different employee is given the honor of presiding at each turning but the same crew of experts is always present. They chose the noon hour so that workers on the hull would not be delayed during the operation. The hull now weighs 12 tons. 
a weight that must be handled cautiously despite the toughness that has been built into it. It lifts and turns inch by inch. This is the first of many times a PT boat will take to the air. Another will be at the launching, and then still later, when lifted aboard a ship to be transported oceans away. But most frequently, it will be when under its own power, leaping the waves. The hull sinks slowly into the steel cradle on wheels. This will be its resting place for the remainder of the trip, the length of the assembly room floor. It will roll out of the big door and on to another building for additional fittings, and finally, it will go out to the launching crane and slip away, waterborne, from infancy into its own element. Soon the workers, back from lunch, are busy again, inside, topside and outside. Deep in the hull, they are fitting girders into place. The hollow construction and comparatively small size enable a couple of men to handle them with ease. But they are still capable of performing the double function of supporting the major weights to be installed later and strengthening the hull bottom against stresses from that direction. When heavy seas and distant oceans apply their twisting, crushing force, these girders stand firm in the heart and bowels of the high-jumping PT. Their laminated strength is absolute insurance against any structural failure. Outside paint is sprayed on, marking the waterline. One kind of paint above and another below. There's still camouflage to come. On the deck, there are installations to be made before the decking arrives. Metal strengthening straps distribute the stresses and strains of the torpedo tube installation. Torpedo and tube, weighing close to two tons on a plunging PT, must be anchored deep in the boat's structure. At this time, the covering board is laid on the deck beam. There's always plywood arriving one minute and being used the next. Its advantage in many portions of the boat is greater strength and lightness. In many special constructions, Elko does its own lamination, as with girders. But standard plywood can also be used for less vital parts. The deck, for instance, is an Elko job. Two 80-foot strips must be glued from sheets of mahogany plywood scarfed together to make them strongest at the point of joining. Every inch of the surface is sanded. A crew of able-bodied men is required to move it to the assembly room. Reminds you of a zoo's attendants preparing to feed a reluctant python. Once aboard the PT, however, the deck lies down quiet as a rug. A few thousand screws keep it there. The joiner shop, another of the many woodworking sections of the plant, sees the construction of major sub-assemblies. Most of the superstructure of the boat comes out of this shop ready for its final fitting. A cabin trunk is being put together. Whether in the endless cold winds of the Aleutians or the sudden tropic storms of the South Pacific, it must be snug. And snug it is. No leaks, no holes, no errors. The chart house is also constructed here. Soon it will be moved to a flat top PT on the assembly floor. The sheets of veneer around a machine gun, Parrot, are protection against wind and wave. Bullets are another question, but they have to catch you first. A PT is as hard to hit as its fast-moving wooden sister of the air, a mosquito bomber. The installation of turrets and deck houses is delicate work. The clearances have to be like those of a piston in the cylinder. That's where the woodworkers of the joiner shop and those who brought the hull and deck openings to precise measurements join in Elko teamwork. Wood fibers from opposite ends of the earth have been shaped to a strange transfiguration in an American factory. Elko does not pretend to be a steel mill or an iron foundry, but many of the purposeful alterations of unshaped material take place in our metal shop. We bend the sheets of metal, we hammer them into place. There's grinding to be done and pipes must be bent. A hundred routine changes are made for the special uses of this intricately fitted boat. There's also welding, not up to the massive fusions of a Brooklyn Navy Yard, but enough to make the parts hold tight come hell exploding shell or high water. And a girl welder with her dark glasses and blue flame is doing what used to be a man's job. 